This is Community Forum, a service of CAN TV. I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez. Chicago Eco House aims to renew neighborhoods and help people renew their lives. Our guests, Hannah Bonham and Keelan Blackwell, are here to discuss this work of hope, compassion, and restoration. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks. Juan Carlos. Appreciate I'm it. Glad to have you here. As um, I just met you a few days ago, Keelan, and you were able to work it out and come in. Thanks. Thanks so much. And thanks for doing this great, exciting work. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about each of you individually and what you do at Chicago Eco House. Uh, Hannah, please. Okay. So I'm involved in community relations. So mm -hmm. basically, we're trying to find ways to um, create relationships <coughs> between, um, like through our organization, between um, people in Englewood and mm -hmm. elsewhere in the city. Um, Englewood, as we all know, it's in the news a lot. Everybody you know, here's what, you know, goes on there. The bad news, um, right? Mostly the bad, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of concerned people in the city, um, but they don't know kind of where to go with their concern or what to do. And so um, I see my role as kind of um, finding ways to connect mm -hmm. people to um, just sort of real lives, you know, in Englewood, but also um, to be able to build relationships that can then benefit um, um, our organization, what we're trying to do. Okay, great. And Keelan, uh, you're one of the founders. Yep, yes, yeah, so I'm the co-founder and president of Chicago Eco House. Mm -hmm. We've been around for about a year now. Mm -hmm. um, my background is actually in community organizing and renewable energy. So, you know, early on in my career, I was in the Peace Corps for a couple of years in Thailand. I also worked as a community organizer around affordable housing. In, in Thailand? In, no, actually in suburban Milwaukee. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Thailand is doing more rural uh, development, uh, helping farmers with uh, okay. economic capacity building. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been around a little bit. Um, wow. And then uh, I was actually work, I used to work for a biofuels uh, company out of Milwaukee okay. um, for the last few years. Um, and now I have my own personal business um, mm -hmm. in renewable energy. Um, so like when we started the Chicago Eco House, mm -hmm. my roommate and I, who, uh, who was the co-founder. And you guys met through Cra Craigslist, right? <laughs> yep, that's correct one. <laughs> 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 yeah, we actually met Craigslist. You know, a lot uh -huh. of people think that Craigslist <laughs> is a scary, spooky place. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, sometimes good things can happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I didn't know my roommate from Adam prior mm -hmm. to uh, October of uh, 2013. Um, and, you know, I was looking for a place. At the time, I was living in Merrill's Park. Um, mm -hmm. and I was looking for, you know, somewhere I can come to the city, try to get my feet wet. Um, and, you know, he was there, came into uh, his apartment. We sort of uh, had instant chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so nowadays we're really good friends. Uh, but mm -hmm. at that time, I was already doing a lot of community work in Inglewood um, wow. at the high school, Team Inglewood High School down there on 63rd mm -hmm. and Stewart. Um, and he just came alongside me, and we both found that we had a similar passion of trying to turn around the inner city and help Chicago. Mm. So you guys clicked. You, you have this chemistry. You're good friends. Right. Um, Usually that just results in a good party time. You know, <laughs> like let's hang out and go to the bars and um, meet people. Uh, I don't know. That's usually what it translates to. Oh, well, what, you know, uh, yeah. What is it? What was that moment? Where, or what were those conversations like? Where, where both of you said, you know, we we've got to do something and um, and make it green. Well, you know, we got a lot of that parting out of our system many years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I'm in my 30s now. Larry's in his 30s. Um, you 30s know, so. is a new 20s, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stretch it out. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, but Larry's also a father of two kids. So I think from Larry's uh, point of view, you know, having children. Oh, his, he settled you down then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Larry's oldest son is 13, his uh, daughter's uh, seven. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I've uh, just always been more passionate about community mm -hmm. development just because my dad was community organizer growing up um, okay. in Wisconsin. So, you know, our, I guess our initial connection was actually around sports. So, mm -hmm. you know, he really liked watching sports, so did I. But mm -hmm. then as we just spent more time together, you know, like what roommates normally do, we just start talking about some of the deeper issues. Um, and one of the things that both resonated with us was a lot of the violence and mm -hmm. the poverty going on in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, we were talking about it right before the show. How is that you connected with them, Hannah? And it's, it's kind of a roundabout story in yeah. some ways, right? So um, <clears throat> I um, was talking to a friend about some things that I was wanting to do in the inner city. So I moved to Chicago 
uh, almost 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. My best friend and I had a list of cities. We, we picked one, it was Chicago. We were gonna live here for a year for fun. We lived in the Gold Coast. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it ended up that I stayed, you know, longer than the year, and the longer that I stayed, the more what drew me wasn't all the glitz and the glamour, but was really some of the history of, of Chicago. And I had been here when I was 15 on the south side, actually, funny enough, right beside Englewood, we, blocks away. Wow. Um, and it really impacted me. We were with a lot of kids who were living at that time in the Robert Taylor homes. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it just, it really impacted me so that, you know, years later when I lived here, you know, I started doing a lot of research and reading about, you know, the, the different neighborhoods in Chicago and why is it so segregated mm -hmm. and why is, you know, the poverty and the violence, you know, mm -hmm. the way that it is. Um, and so um, three years ago, I decided to move to the west side to try to understand it from a little more of a personal place. Mm. And I had some ideas about... Not many people do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, you know, mm -hmm. it. Um, I, I felt like, um, you know, a lot of people said, you know, aren't you scared? Isn't mm -hmm. this, you know, how can you do this? And I felt in turn that I was able to see the real, um, mm -hmm. the real thing, whereas people have to rely on kind of just what the media shows. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I was very privileged to be able to see, you know, kind of the day to day also, and really fall in love with the people in my neighborhood and, in, and on my block. Um, and it impacted me in a way that I really wanted to do something that made a difference. So then, how did you finally connect and, and start working together? Um, yeah, so um, I was telling a friend on, we, we were mm -hmm. road tripping from a wedding, you know, 11 hours in the car, so you just talk about anything because you have like all this time. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I was telling him about some of the things I was trying to do in East Garfield, and he said, you, know, you really should get connected to the Chicago Ego House because um, they're trying to do some similar things, mm -hmm. and they really want to make an impact in the inner city. And what really drew me was one, um, you know, focus around abandoned housing because that's what mm -hmm. I was trying to do. Uh, but two, it was um, it was something that um, was going to create jobs, which I felt like was a huge need, and I mm -hmm. wasn't sure like what the answer to that. Mm -hmm. And um, three, it was something that could be replicated. Mm -hmm. And so instead of putting all of my energy into one house like I was trying to do, I thought, you know, what would it look like to actually do something that could be replicated? all over the city of Chicago and then in other cities around the U.S. that are struggling with similar um, issues. Right, and um, you mentioned one of the keywords and something that uh, you obviously is in your um, logo and your website, abandoned houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, why, uh, why not just tear them down? Why not, why restore them? Why build them up? Why look <coughs> to put uh, homeless folks in there? That's a great question, Juan Carlos. I'm mm -hmm. actually glad you asked that. This is one of my you know, biggest passions. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, in the city of Chicago, there's estimates of that the city has about anywhere from 30 to 50,000 abandoned homes. That and many? Lots. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to get an wow. accurate count. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I've seen estimates as high as 50,000. You know, we mm -hmm. include the lots as well. Okay. Um, and most of those are concentrated in the west side and the south side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, you know, if you look at a place like Detroit, because the, I've, I've read uh, uh, in the news that in one neighborhood of Detroit, they did adopt that solution. They just started tearing down all these homes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, essentially you just had, you know, for blocks and blocks and blocks, just, you know, leveled properties and mm -hmm. vacant lots. And, yeah, the crime went away, but that's because the people went away. Right. right? You know, so just for, abandoned neighborhoods. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you just have a gutted neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, in the gutted, most exactly. literal sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, for us, we care about the people, right? And one of the things that bother us is that a lot of times when, you know, in the conversation about gentrification, about mm -hmm. uh, economic and community development, it seems to be more about, you know, physical restoration in terms of the buildings mm -hmm. that attract a new demographic mm -hmm. that isn't indigenous to that community. Usually you know? affluent and white. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, to be, to be blunt about it. Right. Um, you know, so for us, you know, we want to try to, uh, pr you know, preserve the people who are there, at least give them an opportunity to choose, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, one thing that we're talking about in the green room um, mm -hmm. is how there's this trend that a lot of poor and minority neighbor neighborhoods and people are getting pushed to the edges of the city, right? Mm -hmm. Right, And it's just That's making true. it even more difficult, creating more obstacles to go to, to, go to school, go to work as you know a lot of the jobs are going into the you know downtown areas so mm -hmm. you know I, I remember like even uh you know early on when i was working in inglewood um mm -hmm. i came across a guy who had to it took him two hours just to get to work you know one two way. hours right mm -hmm. so he had to catch a bus to another bus to get to the train then another bus 
then finally get to work and then do it all back, you know? So now imagine doing that this time of year when it's cold, you're talking about sub-zero temperatures, right? Um, you're talking you know, about a three hour commute then, mm -hmm. not, not necessarily a two hour commute. Right, mm -hmm. so, you're, so you're spending almost half your day, right. you know, on the bus and mm -hmm. on the train. And I was like, well, how much are you getting paid? You know, he's like, oh, well, you know, I'm working as a server making like $9 an hour. Wow. Right, mm -hmm. you know, so that gives you an idea of just how challenging it is for uh, people in these neighborhoods to be able to take care of themselves economically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so when we start this eco house, where we, the reason why we didn't want to just, you know, wipe out all the houses is because we didn't just want to add another barrier mm -hmm. um, to make life more difficult for people. Right. Um, and our whole goal is to try to create a inner city renaissance, right? We want to try to revitalize it first by creating an economic engine that can produce jobs. And we think the most viable way to do that is through the emerging green industry boom that, uh, um, you know, I've seen projections as high as 500 million jobs could be created mm -hmm. globally mm -hmm. by mid-century. Um, Obama, you know, in 2009, he mm -hmm. mentioned that his goal was to create 5 million mm -hmm. green collar jobs by the end of his term. And he's already created, or, you know, the U.S. has already created 2.1 million mm -hmm. green collar jobs, right? So we just wanted to try to direct a lot of that into the inner city, because mm -hmm. um, right now a lot of the green energy movement, a lot of the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a lot of the job development has been more in the suburbs, it's mm -hmm. been in more, you know, white, affluent neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and we're just asking, well, why can't, you know, minority neighborhoods, inner city neighborhoods, the people who need it the most, uh, right. you know, partake in that economic growth? Right, definitely. So how exactly is this translating to um, on the ground work, like when you're actually getting your hands dirty and talking to, and listening and talking to people and connecting um, organizations, how how is that working? What's that look like in the day to day work of Chicago Eco House? Well, it's it's kind of interesting because mm -hmm. we kind of found that a lot of people, you know, your your normal people in the neighborhoods, they don't really think about anything green, right? Like mm -hmm. it, just because it, they haven't been invited to the conversation yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we found that they're actually pretty excited. So there's several organizations that we're working with right mm -hmm. now. Rage with, you know, Aisha Butler, um, Pastor Dwayne Grant at uh, Greater Inglewood, um, United Methodist Church, uh, mm -hmm. Teamwork Inglewood, and other local organizations who really embraced mm -hmm. the Chicago Eco House and what we're trying to bring. Mm -hmm. And the thing that they're most excited about is our green collar jobs component, where we're, right now we're in conversations with, you know, different companies and groups who create a uh, green, green collar job training program specifically mm -hmm. for homeless and at-risk young people in the Inglewood neighborhood. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. the, you know, because there's, there's a lot of social development work, right, right that goes right, on right. in the inner city, right. um, around education, um, mm -hmm. around families, and those are all, it's all very important work. Um, you know, we, we definitely support and advocate for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, we really believe that until people have a means to take care of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Could be able to put a roof over your head, be able to put food on the table, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that a lot of that work is gonna be, um, it's only gonna be able to go so far, right? Because um, one of the things that, when you look at the history of these neighborhoods, um, it hasn't always been like that. You look at a place like Inglewood, in right. the 60s and 70s, it wasn't this ghetto that it is today. Right. They're one of the reasons that was the case is because, you know, you had more blue collar manufacturing jobs. Right. Right. You know, People that, are making a good living. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. you're making it's easier to get a job where you're able to make twenty, thirty dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, who lives in Milwaukee, he worked at he worked at Briggs and Stratton, which is an engine right. manufacturing right. company, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for thirty years. You know, right. making thirty bucks an hour. He retired with a great pension, mm -hmm. um, and because of that job, he was able to take care of you know my mom, mm -hmm. which put her in a position to be able to take care of me. Mm -hmm. right? right. So when you take away the that that basic ability for people to take care of themselves, it doesn't just affect that one person, it's affecting the generations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, down to your grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Right, right, right. I think mm -hmm. there's also that, this idea that people don't want to work or mm -hmm. people just want to live off of... The stereotypes. Yeah, right? people mm -hmm. that just want to deal drugs. And it's really interesting because I remember, you know, hearing that from somebody and thinking, I wonder if they've ever actually had a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. with somebody, you mm -hmm. know, on welfare or somebody who you know was a drug dealer mm -hmm. and because on my block I, I had several of those mm -hmm. and there was one kid especially he had dropped out um, when he was um, a freshman in high school mm -hmm. so and now he was 19 so he can't go back into school and he's starting to realize what a life you know dealing drugs you know was like mm -hmm. so he came up to me and he said can you can you hook me up with a job any job and uh, and I said, well, I, I'm not sure. He said, I'll do anything. He said, you know, I used to work at Burger King. I was a really hard worker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I thought, 
I don't know anyone who is begging me mm -hmm. for a, a, a job at a fast food restaurant in order to get off the streets. And so I came up to him weeks later and there was an opportunity in an urban farm and I thought am I gonna have to sell this as like is it cool enough like mm -hmm. is it gonna be is he gonna think it's kind of weird and I just literally I hadn't even explained it I just said there's a possible job you know with the urban farm mm -hmm. and he said I'll do it I'll do it just let me know I'll do it mm -hmm. so you know he was just saying I've got to get off these streets I've got to get off you know doing this so mm -hmm. it's really important I think for people to realize that mm -hmm. you know a lot of times when people aren't given a lot of choices they have to sort of grasp at what what is in front of them mm -hmm. um, and we really believe that you know giving the choice mm -hmm. to stay in the neighborhood giving the choice to work a job um, really could um, you know be something that could um, just change you know a lot more than those few people could actually change the whole neighborhood right. you know and if you don't mind if I could no, just no, go ahead, off go what ahead. you said um, you know, because one of the things I really believe is that, you know, perception, someone's perception of you is a reality of you, right? Mm -hmm. right? So when you have this perception that's constantly being portrayed in the media that the inner city is just filled with these thugs who are lazy, they're, you know, just... All they do is want to do is drug deal. Mm -hmm. right. right, you know, so then the message that's being conveyed to the business community is, I don't want to invest there. Mm -hmm. right. right, right. So you have right. a lot of people who Hannah's talking about right. that never talk to anyone who's lived in the inner city. Mm -hmm. They've never driven. I mean, you'll be amazed how many people who I've met here in Chicago, have never been south of uh, the Roosevelt stop at the red line. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, we've made that observation with some friends of mine. You know, yeah. like, well, how many people venture to the south side? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so through Chicago Eco House, um, we're, we're, wow, this could be an hour-long conversation, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and we're getting close to the end. Mm -hmm. But uh, tell me what you've done in this year and um, what you're planning in the year to come, please. Okay, well, so like in 2014, in our mm -hmm. inaugural year, mm -hmm. our main program has been the science club that we work at, um, at Team Inglewood High School, right? So mm -hmm. once a week we would uh, take kids in the high mm -hmm. school and expose them to different science concepts. We uh, worked in a little garden at Team Inglewood High School where we had kids mm -hmm. like, you know, plant some basic uh, like basil and just mm -hmm. some, you know, like a little small community garden or mm -hmm. a school garden. Um, this year we kind of want to take it to the next level. So we're working with Greater Inglewood uh, United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. um, who owns a block and a half of vacant lot space. Okay. Um, and we're looking to develop that into a community garden. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, as a result, we're, we're looking to do our eco club right now um, at the church. Um, mm -hmm. And then also we're trying to, we want to uh, build out uh, eco houses and, and some of the vacant housing that are around mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Grant's church down there at Greater, Wood, Ingle, uh, Greater Inglewood UMC. Um, he's actually in a unique situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually learned this past weekend that that part of Inglewood, which is by the 63rd and Halstead stop, mm -hmm. local people call that show no love city, right? Um, it's actually one of the flashpoints. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's like on a, a, a gang line. So like okay. right there on Green Street, there's mm -hmm. a lot of shootings that go on there, a lot of violence. As a matter of fact, Hannah and I, uh, you know, over the summer when we were going down the neighborhood just canvassing, mm -hmm. we almost got caught in the middle of a drive-by shooting. Mm -hmm. um, wow. You know, we, if it was just you know, a few minutes okay. earlier, yeah. you know, we could have been, you mm -hmm. know, an innocent casualty mm -hmm. when we'd be having this conversation right now. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so uh, this, this is an area where we really feel like it needs the development. It needs and, that hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it needs that hope. Um, and we want to try to build a demonstration project to show the neighborhood uh, how mm -hmm. green energy and renewable energy can benefit the neighborhood. Um, and it's actually interesting too because uh, right across the street is where they're building the Whole Foods project mm -hmm. on 63rd and Halstead. So it's already an area where there's some energy and the city's already looking at in terms of redeveloping. So we're just trying to come alongside that. Wow, wow. Um, well, we are out of time, but, um, and I, I wish we could continue talking and we certainly will at some point in the future. And um, yeah, just keep us informed about what you're doing. Thanks okay. so much for coming out today. Thanks for the All time. right, thanks Juan Carlos, we really appreciate, appreciate it. it. And to you, our audience, thank you for joining us. Community Forum is a community service of CAN TV. If your nonprofit organization would like to work with CAN TV, call 312 738 1400 and ask for nonprofit services. Tune into Community Forum for local issues and concerns every Saturday at 7 30 p.m. on CAN TV 21. I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez. Thank you for joining us.